previously on Solve the World. Atticus Further is a flawed human being. He is not perfect, and having never dealt with real pressure, a genuine crisis, he was unable to do what had to be done. His father waited in the bathtub of the Further house for over 40 minutes. Solve the World, a fictional adventure told in 100 episodes. You're holding the keys to your soul in your hand. Episode 65, Concerning Grace. To be young and in love is to find grace. If you've walked this earth long enough to find love, you've tallied up enough regret to weigh you down. That's just how life works. There do exist those fine individuals that try to deny wrongdoing, or ignore it, the type that say they have no regrets. Given that they're not chemically imbalanced, there's only one of two options for said individuals. Either they're lying to you, they do have aches, inner groanings, and regrets that smart every night at bed rest, or they found love. Under the lush branches of love, a person, particularly a young person who is new to the fresh scent and shade of love's labor, finds peace. The lover has no regrets. Even the bad stuff, old skeletons from when daddy hit you, it's okay. It's actually better than okay, because every divot in the road, every obstacle, every smackdown, every sin, led you to this love. And you wouldn't trade this love in for all the rubies in the world. The feeling, utter elation, is unmatched on the spectrum of human experience. To live with no regrets. To live under the cooling shade of grace, day in, day out, is to live, simply, a happy life. You, you want to live a happy life. I want to live a happy life. Atticus Further wanted to live a happy life. Now, that's all gone. It's a true statement to say that young love is more powerful than aged love. This is not true because there is something purer or more innocent about youth, by no means. In many ways, the youth of the world are more jacked up and evil than the rest of us. This has been true since time immemorial. The reason is simple. When you're old, you understand the gravity and subsequent necessary consequences of your mistakes. This is good. Youth, on the other hand, have frankly no idea. They can't conceive of the real-time consequences to their actions. And dare I say it, inactions. Thus, young love is the most potent force on Earth because it seems to the youngling to be nothing short of magic. It came out of nowhere. It removed all pains, all dreadful memories, all wrongdoings, and replaces them with inclusion, warmth, a sense of being known. Therefore, young love spoiled is the worst of all things, for in its claws lies the abandonment of so very much. Take young Atticus further. He knew love. Betty... This smart, strong-willed, micromanaging artist of girl somehow fell into his lap. For reasons that Atticus would never understand, she liked him. A lot. Time proved to both parties that the thing they longed for most was just more time together. Time apart felt incomplete, like a joke without a punchline. Now, rewriting history, Atticus blamed the romance's failure on all the crud that had happened in the world. Once upon a time, Atticus watched a documentary on Jewish people that survived the concentration camps during World War II. Almost as a rule, when they got out, they all got married. Not to people they lived with in the camps, but other survivors. Like, within months, sometimes weeks. 
They'd meet each other, then, a day later, decide it was good to get married. And, most amazingly of all, these marriages stuck. Lifelong unions all. If only that sort of thing would have worked for Atticus and Betty. The truth was, the tragedy that quite literally knocked on their front door in Louisiana tore the two lovebirds apart. Atticus was a smart enough boy to see why everything fell like it did. He needed time after he saw his father like that. He was a good father. Seeing him that way, it does something to a son. And reality can be a cruel witch. Atticus had to become the father now. He had to become his dad for Scout. He had to be the man of the house. And that was okay. Atticus would rise to the call. But, but not just yet. He didn't have time to mourn, time to process this new life. That was the problem. Betty, Scout, they couldn't afford to wait for Atticus to get his wits about him. Life was moving fast now, twisting into a post-apocalyptic hellscape, and the ladies of the further estate needed their Atticus to be present, to be a force. And he wasn't. He was in mourning, he was scared, he was in shock, he was frightened of Betty, terrified to serve as Scout's protector. That was too much to ask of him now, wasn't it? Atticus thought something would give. He didn't have to play den leader, not yet. Something would give. Grace would shed light on all of them. It didn't work out that way. Maybe it was the inability to mourn properly, to bury his father, to have a natural funeral. Maybe, but Atticus was angry at Betty. She killed him. She refused to slow down. That's all Atticus needed. Just a little time to breathe, to game plan, to sketch out a good and proper future for them. She didn't allow for that. Nope, she had to micromanage the situation. Kill old Pa. Go headlong down that straight and narrow path. So, Atticus gave in to the silent treatment. This was love, what he and Betty had. It would bend for the season, but it wouldn't break. Atticus was certain of this. But he didn't know young love is fragile. When Betty sent Scout away, Atticus couldn't bear it. He blamed her for everything. He never said as much, but she knew it. He knew. They all knew. Right about then, Smugly started appearing. It was a way out. A way to say, Hey, I'm not ready to be a father, a husband, a caregiver, a patricidist, a whatever. Smugly could fill the role for him. Who cares who he is, what he wants? Clearly, Smugly's a man hiding behind a mask. And Atticus further desperately wanted a mask to hide behind. He signed up was whisked away to beautiful New Zealand, just about as far away as he could get from Betty. From late June, when Smugly first hit the international airwaves, onwards, the Free Church at Christ Church had a tremendous organizational mess on their hands. Hundreds, then thousands, then tens of thousands, now hundreds of thousands, of immigrants, refugees, deserters, thieves, wives, husbands, elderly, uneducated, overqualified, white, black, brown, purple, indigo-colored masses swarm the church's habitation. Let it be known. Neither you, nor me, nor any national government I know of could have handled the onslaught of humanity better than the Free Church did. First, the walls. Tremendous walls. All around. The vision of this town, this community, was dead on arrival if they couldn't keep the infection out. So, 18 meter high walls, 10 meters deep, reinforced, warriors mounted on the wall tops, armed to the teeth, just in case the zombie apocalypse creates human ladders to ascend. Next, work. Every member of Free Church needed to work. Unemployed people, particularly young people, 
will find trouble if they are not kept busy. So, busy. Jobs. Jobs for everyone. Employment had, absolutely had to be 100%. It went like this. Upon arrival, you filled out a survey of your skills. Often, you could pick your profession. If you didn't, or couldn't, work was assigned to you. This, essentially, was the case with Atticus. He was given a rotation at the Free Church Psychiatric Ward as an evening nurse. Atticus worked six days a week, from lights out at 10.30 p.m. to 7 a.m. the next morning. As one of Atticus's co-workers put it, the, quote, beyond graveyard shift. From 7 to noon the next day, Atticus trained. Education was highly valued at the first religion of epistemology and experience. School was in session. Coming to New Zealand, Atticus was no nurse. By the time he would leave, he most certainly would be. For the most part, there was no direct application to all the skills Atticus was learning. He learned early on how to give a shot to an unwilling client. That was a must. Before his first week was out, injecting a sleep-inducing agent via sharp needle to a screaming crazy became a nightly ritual. The only question was who, on any given night, would be the winner-winner of the isoflurane nitrous oxide cocktail. Most nights, the lucky recipient was a one, Mr. Sid Kalfas. Sid had plenty of problems. Plenty. Not among those myriad problems was his appearance. Sid was 54 years old, but he had the body of an 18-year-old and thick, bushy black hair. The hospital just wouldn't let him grow a beard. If he did, he'd maybe have a chance at looking his age. As it stood, though, Sid looked young. Way too young. Atticus often found himself forgetting this. He'd talk to Sid like a compatriot, a fellow classmate, a friend. He forgot that Sid was the same age as his father, older even. The problem with Sid was the night terrors. That alone, you'd think, wouldn't get him stuck in a psych ward. But in this case, it did. Sid would wake up so bothered by his dreams that he'd urgently seek to purge himself of the nightmare. Often, he'd hurt himself. Sometimes, he would try to hurt others. He was 23 when he was first committed. Back then, he was sharing an apartment with a young man by the name of Rudy. One night, Sid had a particularly bad terror. The terror that night, it can't rightly be described. But behind the veil of personalized metaphors and dreadful floating discombobulated images was a simple message. All of Sid's night terrors carried a variant on this one specific message. That night, the message sent to Sid Kalfas' dreaming mind was this. The soul sucker is coming. He'll suck your soul out of your bones. There's only one way to stop him. Free your soul before he gets here. He's right outside your window now. Tick, tick, tick. He's knocking at the glass. He'll be here soon. Invading. Sid arose that night. Dressed in nothing but tidy whities he grabbed the longest knife he could find in the kitchen drawer. Rudy survived. Barely. Sid's freedom didn't. A lifelong resident of Christchurch, when the Free Church took over the city, they also took control of all government buildings. Sid and his fellow clientele slash inmates were seamlessly transitioned to the church's authority because of his illness that, quite tragically, no doctor had been able to successfully medicate to date. Sid had not mentally advanced in his 31-year stay at Rose Hospital for the Mentally Handicapped. In fact, he had, as some sort of survival instinct, regressed. How's it going tonight, Sid? Atticus asked one night. Fine. Can't sleep? No. Did you try? No. Why not? Because the bunny rabbit? Did he whisper to you today? Sid didn't answer. Hey, Atticus said tenderly but firmly. What did he say? He said you're not as good as you seem. Do you believe him? Yes, 
Why? I don't want to say. Sid was sitting on the ground beside his bed. Can I sit next to you for a moment? Yes. Atticus sat. You want to know a secret? Yes. The bunny's right. Are you going to go to hell? <laughs> What's that got to do with it? All bad people go to hell. And good people go to heaven? Not all good people. Why is that? Some of us don't get to retire. Retire? You'd know if you talked to you. Who? The bunny? The bunny, the bright woman, Waka Papa, all of it's one. No, no. Waka Papa isn't a person. It's part of the Maori culture. We've been over this. Do you know what hell's like? No. Sid, listen. I'm trying to tell you. I'm not a good person. Sid looks scared. No, it's, it's okay. Really. But, here. Do you want to know why I'm not a good person? Okay. I made my girlfriend kill my father. Then I did nothing to protect my baby sister. What happened to her? Who? Your sister. She's somewhere. I, I don't know where. I hurt Rudy. I know. I know, Sid. It's okay. That was a long time ago. No. It was last night. What? What do you mean? I was in a... Apartment. Sid is crying. I stabbed him with a knife. I... I saw worms coming out of his stomach. It was just a dream. I know. But it still happened. No. No. Dreams aren't real, Sid. Who are you to say? <laughs> Everyone says they're not real. Rudy, the Rudy that shows up in your dream, he's not real. The real Rudy is fine. No worms in his stomach. Hey, 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 hey now. You want to know a secret? Yes. You don't get to go to heaven for being good. No? No. In fact, that's just a trick the bunny tries to convince you of. Sid wipes away his tears. What trick? The trick is that heaven is a prize for doing good things. How do you know? Atticus smiles. Because no one's good. Everyone is bad. Everyone? Everyone. Sid's eyes widen. Atticus's speech wasn't landing like he hoped it would. He chose then to fast forward to the end. Get to the good part. Uh, Sid, do you know what grace is? Do you know that word? Yes. Tell me what it means. It means you're shown favor. Someone up above likes you. Atticus smiles. Yeah, that about sums it up. So, I think... For you and me, grace is our only hope. We need to say, every day, sometimes multiple times a day, Hey, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. And then, what we do next is hope for grace. Sid seemed to be mulling this over. Yeah, but... Do you know what hell's gonna be like? Atticus sighed, pulled a prepared needle out from his coat pocket, and surreptitiously jammed it into Sid's side. I don't know, Sid. I don't know. Almost immediately, Sid slumped over. A knock on Sid's cell. Another nurse in scrubs. Hey, someone's at the door for you. Who? I don't know. Some security people said some girl named Jen. I didn't see her face. Hey, you think it's Jen Dash, huh? Coming for a little midnight action? You keeping secrets from the rest of us, Addy? Atticus gave his co-worker a friendly shoulder jab, trying to deflate the question. Good night, Sid. Sleep well, Atticus said as he hit the main lights in Sid's room.
Out in the hallway, behind three security guards, Jen stood in the shadows wearing a smugly mask. She didn't need to remove it. Atticus recognized her immediately. Hello, Atticus. Hello, Jen. So, your big news. Atticus finally spoke, breaking the awkward silence. Yeah, I guess, Jen said shyly. So, you're a nurse now? Something like that. Can we... can we talk outside? Uh, I'm working right now. Yeah, okay. Maybe when your shift ends? Uh, why are you here, Jen? I came... I came to get you. Get me? Where are you planning on taking me? Okay, here goes. I want to save Scout. That's what I want to talk to you about. I have a plan. No. Nah. -uh. No. What do you mean, no? No, I live here. This is who I am now. Scout needs us, Jen insisted. Look, the whole world needs us. I'm making a new life for myself here. You... You don't even know what this place is, Jen protested. Like you do, I met the elders. That took Atticus by surprise. How are they like? They're... They're willing to make a deal. What sort of deal, Jen? I convinced them that if I do what they want, they'd let me take you with me. I don't want to go with you. I don't want to leave. Atticus, don't you understand? You won't have to go through with it. The glass house. We could leave tonight. Or tomorrow. You won't have to go through the glass house. I'm going to go to the glass house. Atticus, you can't mean that. That's insane. New place, new rules. Atticus. 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 Somewhere in Durham State Forest, Maine, Miles found him. Do you accept the hex? This is the cost, Miles said. This is the cost. Uh, perform it when I'm satisfied. Payment must be made now. Well, okay then. The Wendigo, something blurry between beast and man, muttered unknowable words. His hands in the shape of claws floated above Miles' head gyrating in unholy spheres. It is done. May I speak? You may ask as your prize. It could all be over soon. The Wendigo was silent his presence hulking. Miles had entertained the massive beast's presence once before, but that time, it was on the Piper's turf. Here, amidst his own land, the Wendigo was king. Miles could feel it in his bones. No, not his bones per se. The marrow of his bones. He felt the inner sanctum of his bones sloshing to and fro, causing a stir from within. Good. The Wendigo's words weren't just spoken. They were monuments, etchings in marble written centuries past. Miles' bones began to shake. His hands were twitching. <sighs> the Shining Man. Miles managed to bellow. He's outmatched. The, the Pied Piper's won. Why do you insist on calling him that? Do you have a better name for him? Miles dared the monster. Many. 
That left Miles wordless. Wordless and in pain. His body was nearly spasming, twitching all about the hex. Its work writhed through Fa's body. The cost of this conversation was steep. You don't want to be here when Leviathan awakes. You know nothing. True, true, I know nothing, but... Miles' head bobbed now uncontrollably. When will the hex pass? When I undo it. Please? Please, lighten my load. No. This was going unimaginably poorly. An outcome such as this was never anticipated. Miles knew these old ones. They didn't wrestle the way mere men did. But still, Miles didn't see this coming. His limbs, they were burning now. Burning from the inside out. A grave, evil desire snuck up into Fa's mind. He suppressed it. As long as he could. God knows. He suppressed it. There's a way for you to escape. Or, at least, return a balance to the war. You fight on the front lines of battle. Why would you want balance? There... uh, Miles stammered. The pain pulsated like a snake slithering up his veins. I'm not with him in this. He made a promise uh, to me. He's not holding up his side. I need time. I need the world not to be over. I I need your help. Find the bald judge. He's down south. Mexico. He loves Judas. He loves betrayers. He loves conflict. He loves death. He will help you. No, I... I need you. Just me? I have Merlin and Mrs. Moose. Soon others. This was a bold-faced lie. It was the pinnacle of rashness to lie to an old one. Miles hadn't visited Merlin or Mrs. Moose yet. He honestly thought Wendigo would be the easiest to convince of the three, and perhaps the most powerful. Getting him on board would help the cause for the others. What do you need us to do? The lie worked. Wendigo never saw through it. After Miles Fa convinced the beast to join his cause, make the Great March North, Miles found some variety of favor from the monster. Yet, There was no grace. No grace for Miles Fogg. But I'll tell you what it would have looked like. Just this. The Wendigo would have removed the Hex. That would have been grace. Miles didn't deserve the Hex to be removed. It was the cost of the conversation. He knew this. Grace would have been an unconditional removal of the serpent-like pain. And not just the pain but the evil. So much of Miles' efforts going forward would be focused on suppression. Suppress the evil. Fight it down. Battle it back. What the Wendigo did do was act in his own self-interest. Viewing Miles' plan as personally beneficial, he needed the man-boy to stay alive to work. At least a while. So, Wendigo summoned a virus to slow down the hex. Miles stumbled away that day, out of the purview of the ragged old beast, still sick, still dying, still evil. But sick, dying, and growing evil slowlier than one could have expected. Still, hear this. There is no grace for Miles Faw. Solve the World is produced by me, Dante Stack. You can find attribution for all the sound effects and music heard in this episode and every other episode of Solve the World on our show notes page at DanteStack.com. Hey guys, get your questions ready. Rev them up and send them to me. Send any question you have about the show, about me, about pretty much anything to DanteStack at gmail.com. That's my personal email. I will respond to you and... After episode 67, so in three weeks, we're going to do another Solving the World episode. This is a premium episode in which I just take as much time as possible to answer any question you might have about the show so far. Want to know more about the Pied Piper? Ask me. 
Want to know what's really going on with this ominous glass house that you're about to be introduced to? Ask me. Or you have some question about the Windigo that you just heard about. Now's your opportunity. Send your questions in to me, Dante Stack. That's all one word, D-A-N-T-E-S-T-A-C-K at Gmail. Or you can write me on Facebook, on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash solve the world podcast. All right. That'll be in three weeks, so after episode 67. Send your questions in now, guys. See you next week. (laughs) 